I want to talk about the past 20 years. So this year, as we know, marks the 20th birthday or the 20th anniversary of the creation of the G20. The two of you played leading roles, perhaps the leading roles in creating it. Uh, and it is now viewed as a key forum for discussing global economic policy. So my first question is to Paul Martin. Paul, can you take us back to 1999 and give us a sense of the economic context and remind us why it was created in the first place and how was it constituted? Sure. Uh, just uh, two points before I start. First of all, um, Chris, I am not to your far right. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, the, the second thing, this is a, I want to congratulate Corbin. This is a, probably this is a, the biggest breakfast crowd I've been spoken to in about five years. So you should come more often. Um, when I first became the F finance minister of Canada, I at the same time became finance minister, Canada's uh, rep representative at the finance minister's uh, G7. Um, at, the, at the first meeting, about brand new, uh, brand new finance minister, um, at the end, uh, when the G7 finance ministers had congratulated each other, I pointed out that uh, while we were telling the world uh, its problems, uh, countries like China, India, um, a number of the major emerging economies uh, in the world, primarily those in Asia and uh, Latin America and Africa, uh, were not present. And that had we given any thought uh, to uh, perhaps um, hosting or creating a separate organization that would involve um, many of these countries. Um, I was made very clear to me that that was not on. Um, about what, a year and a half later, uh, when the Mexican peso crisis occurred, uh, and some of you may remember, Canada got ba badly hit by the Mexican peso crisis. Um, uh, I, th again, at a G7 meeting, raised the idea of that what we really needed is a wider body um, not not in increasing the size of the G7, but the G7 had to be part of a wider body. And again, there was not very much interest. And then, uh, two years later, the Asian financial crisis occurred. Now, you may remember that the Asian cri financial crisis was essentially Korea, um, uh, 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 Thailand, uh, and Indonesia. But it was also the time of a uh, debt default by the Russians. Um, and in, in the case of Brazil, one of the largest court currency dev devaluations ever to occur. The world had some, had some major problems. Um, and so at the end of the, the G7 meeting, um, Larry and I just happened to walk out the door together. We had become um, actually quite good friends over the, the time period, and I said, could we, have a, could we have a talk in your office? And he said, sure. And so I, we went into the office and I simply raised the issue um, that look, if, we're going to, if the G7 is going to claim that it can be essentially try to have some guidance in terms of the global economy, um, intervene where necessary, uh, then to do this without China and India and the major economy, uh, major emerging economies of of uh, Asia, Latin America, and, uh, and Africa simply made no sense. He agreed immediately. Um, and so we sat down uh, with a blank sheet of paper and we started going through the kinds of countries that we would want to put in uh, uh, to the G20. The basic, the, the, the basic understandings are they had obviously had to have you know, substantial economies. They didn't have to be the biggest economies in the world. In the case of China and India, they're two countries, obviously with the potential. Um, but it, they had to be they had to be major regional economies. And so, because a lot of times people will ask, well, how come there are countries in the G20 um, which have smaller economies uh, than, let's say, some of the European economies? And the answer is, we were looking for the strong regional players, um, and. Uh, make a long story short, um, what we then decided is that we would ask our officials um, uh, to go out, talk, and we would talk to the G7 members, and we would ask our officials to go out and talk to essentially 
the, the countries that we were thought uh, should be should be asked, um, and essentially that was that that was it. Now, that's also a very short form uh, version. It is very clear uh, that the smartest thing that I did, which is something I should have done probably five years earlier, is I went and got the U.S. Treasury Secretary on my side. And if I hadn't done that, I don't think we would be here this morning. The, the, the second thing that occurred is we asked our officials to go out. The Canadian officials played a very, very important job, but the American officials really went at it. Tim Geithner, who uh, was uh, uh, Larry's senior official, really took this on, coordinated all of the officials. Uh, and so I am delighted to be here, but there's no doubt in my mind that if you want to get something done in this kind, Make sure your friend's the Treasury Secretary. So quick question then to Larry. So I want to come back to the history, but just flash forward to today. Um, if a Canadian or any other finance minister would, were to come today to a U.S. Treasury Secretary and suggest the creation of a new multilateral institution to discuss world problems, can you give us some inkling, Larry, of what a Treasury Secretary might say today? I'll come to that in a second. I want to say something else uh, first. <laughs> I am really glad to be here. I, am, I feel better about the world every time I come to Canada. There are countries with better climates than Canada's. There are countries with more power than Canada has. But there's no country with so consistent a positive, pragmatic, and forceful approach towards promoting global citizenship than Canada. And there's no Canadian... <laughs> and there's no Canadian official I have known and worked with in the nearly 30 years that I've been in the international system, who more strongly embodies that tradition than my good friend, Paul Martin. And Canada has been lucky to have him striding the global stage for all these years. Thank you, Paul, for everything that you have done. I think the meeting's over. I think it's been a success. I'll go. <laughs> I don't think it's very likely that approaches that promoted multilateralism that were premised on there being a global community of nations that saw international engagement in positive sum rather than zero sum terms would be greeted with much enthusiasm by the current uh, administration. It seems to me that the current administration has mostly been retreating from such global cooperative uh, ventures, has been resisting the concept of global public goods and has embraced a very different reading of history than the history that we operated with in the 1990s or the history that I teach in my class. The history that I teach in my class is one in which America has made plenty of mistakes but that it can be proud of the global leadership that won the Cold War and created a foundation and an environment in which the best 75 years of economic performance in the history of mankind could have taken place since the Bretton Woods uh, Treaty. That sees that through the work of international institutions, international negotiation, and discussion. And that's the 
paradigm and the template that it seems to me as the agenda of problems changes, as circumstances change, that can usefully animate the United States and indeed needs to animate the United States as its position of economic dominance is inevitably going to attenuate with the rise of emerging markets, uh, particularly in Asia. But we have an administration that has a very different view. Its view is that that might have all been fine in the 1950s or 1960s or 1970s, but that somehow we have been suckers for the last three decades and that international cooperation has basically been something that has happened at the expense of American citizens and that we need to get back at the people who have screwed us. And within that paradigm, you don't embrace new global cooperative uh, initiatives. You embrace threats and bluster and demands. And that's been U.S. economic diplomacy for the last two and a half years. I think to date, it has produced no, zero, nada benefit. Um, we have renegotiated NAFTA in a way that has incredibly left it essentially identical to the NAFTA we had, except for a very small introduction of provisions from the TPP, which Trade Pacific Partnership, which we had repudiated, and we're not gonna succeed in getting the new legislation through the Congress. We have pronounced absurdities, like the need to put tariffs on European and Canadian steel to protect our national defense at a time when there are fewer workers in the steel industry by a factor of four than there are in the manicure industry. Let me say that again. A quarter as many in steel as in manicure, but where there are 100 times as many people working in steel using industries as in the steel industry, and their situation is all made less competitive by the increase in the input price of uh, steel. We have created an overhang of uncertainty that the IMF believes is reducing global GDP in the hundreds and hundreds of uh, billion dollars, and that our own stock market suggests that every time we bluster negatively about this, half a trillion dollars of wealth are being, uh, dis are, are being destroyed. So I don't think that the United States can afford to sit still. I think the concern that many have that we have come to have global institutions that are a little bit like great global companies, are a little too prone to sit in wood paneled rooms and admire the portraits on the wall and continue in existing ways of thinking and perhaps perpetuate somewhat elitist approaches to problems. I think that's a valid concern and it needs to be addressed but it needs to be addressed through changing the agenda of global cooperation, not through resisting the concept of uh, global cooperation. And so I, I don't think that uh, a Canadian uh, finance minister who came to the US Treasury today would be greeted in the way that my predecessor, Bob Rubin, um, responded to Canadian initiatives or the way that I tried to respond um, when I was uh, 
Treasury Secretary, and I think in an increasingly complicated world, um, that's a sad thing. So we'll get to the future agenda for the G20, but I want to suppose you were writing the history of the G20, either of you, maybe the two of you should write the history of the G20, uh, or try to convince the current administration about the success of the G20. What would you point to in the past 20 years that has been a particular success? And then I'm going to ask you for what has been the, the, the failures, if there have been any, about the G20. Paul, what would you point to as a key success for the G20? Well, I think the fact that, I think the fact of, uh, of its creation. You got when, when you go back to the to the fact that the G7 occurred, uh, or the G20 occurred, because the G7 thought that it could dictate to um, the countries in, involved in the Asian crisis the answer, and those countries told us where to get off and made it very clear. And we then reacted with the creation of the G20 involving those countries. I think that that in itself is a success, as Larry has, uh, Larry has, has pointed out. Um, I also believe uh, that the successes of the G20, um, and this is something that we're, we're I would hope in this discussion that we're going to get into, um, have been minimized uh, by the fact that a major country um, now believes that it can come that, that it can essentially walk away from agreements that it has made. It has made to sign as it is as it is to sign on to the, the Paris Accord as an example, and then to walk away from the Paris Accord uh, is not the is certainly not going to build the kind of confidence that it will allow allow us to deal with what is going to be. At intellect, a, a, a world that is interconnected, but unable, unable to take advantage of it, and I think that is the major issue that we've we've got to face. And that failure, I think, basically casts a pall on everything, which is why this kind of a discussion is so important, and which is why we've got to talk into the future about the future of the G20, so that countries actually take it seriously and how it's going to work. All right, I give you. I wouldn't disagree with what Paul said, but I would give you a somewhat different uh, answer. I think the, I think as Paul argued, the existence of the G20 and the representation of emerging markets at the top table of international economic diplomacy is a big thing. And we don't know all the things that would have gone wrong right. if they had not been at the top table. And we don't know all the cleavages that would have resulted in the absence of that. But I also believe that prudent people try to meet their cardiologist before they have a heart attack. And prudent statesmen plan international institutions to deal with crises before there was a crisis. And if you look at the first half dozen years of the G20, I think the critique can legitimately be levied that the meeting was most of the message. You can point to some things that happened the uh, first round of debt relief for highly indebted poor countries was accelerated by discussions that took place in uh, the uh, G20. Some of the modernization of the development banks was accelerated. But I think you would say that in the first years of the G20, the actual concrete achievements were not large. I will tell you, though, as someone who was there, that when the world went over a cliff economically in 2008, the opportunity to convene the G20 leaders 
initially in Washington in November of 2008 at the single darkest moment of the crisis, and then much more substantively with Gordon Brown's leadership and President Obama's leadership in April of 2009 was central to this not being another Great Depression. Four, huge, actually five, hugely important things were agreed in London in uh, 2009. First, there was an agreement not to turn to protection, to maintain basic openness even in very difficult times. And trade increased by 20 to 25 percent, global trade, in the ensuing 18 months. Second, there was a big shoe that didn't drop in 2009, if you think about it. There was no major emerging market financial crisis. Usually, when the United States and Europe sneeze, it's pneumonia in emerging markets. That's what had happened with the 1982 recession. That's what had happened in 1974 after the oil shock. That's what happened a number of times during the 1990s. It didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? It didn't happen because more rapidly than ever before, there was an agreement on tripling the resources available to the IMF so it could respond to financial crises. And there was a concerted effort made to maintain export finance at a time when banking was nationalizing. And so there was no emerging market crisis. G20 wouldn't have happened without the action of the G20. Third, there was shared diagnosis and freedom that encouraged fiscal stimulus as a central part of the global response. China launched the largest fiscal stimulus program in probably in history. Um, in uh, peacetime, that actually had a lot to do with dominoes that didn't turn over um, in Asia that were uh, very, uh, very uh, important. Um, and the United States launched its fiscal stimulus. There was more fiscal stim There wasn't as much fiscal stimulus as there should have been in Europe. But there was considerably more than there would have been in the absence of uh, the G20. And that, too, propelled the world uh, economy. Fourth, there was a commitment to cooperation so that banking regulation and financial regulation more broadly would stop being a global race to the bottom driven by uh, the bankers. That work goes on. That work will never stop. I think there's a lot more to do on that agenda. But we now agree that we're going to do this in globally cooperative ways, which wasn't an idea that we had before. That was important. And there was an agreement that we, that countries would eliminate, not one that's been fully honored, I hasten to say, but that countries would eliminate fossil fuel subsidies, which if you look, you know, I don't know what the number is, 15% of greenhouse gas emissions come not just from the fact that we don't tax fossil fuels, but from the fact that we actively subsidize them. And there was a commitment that has had some force to eliminate that. That was 20 years work for the G20. That event that prevented a depression justified the whole effort. And I think in general, if you look at institutions, it's a mistake to judge them by what they do every year. What they do is they're there to be mobilized 
by creative and energetic statespeople in time of crisis. And because of what Paul Martin did, the G20 was there at that moment, and it did things that are hugely important. And I don't think anyone can look out at the world we have today and not think that the G20 will be called on at some point in the future. So just, if I, if I might, Chris, just, just to pick up on that, one of the problems when you look at the G20 is that you, you follow, you, you look to see what the communique says, um, and then you, you ask yourself, well, have they picked up on what the previous G20 did or the previous one before that? And you start to say to yourself, so how, you know, what happens in these meetings is individual countries want to show off for their own populations. And as a result of that, they're going to bring up something new or the communique may not deal with it to the way that you want. But the underlying, which is what Larry is saying, the underlying success of the G20 really lies in the consistency with which they deal with major issues that build up. And one of the things that I would suggest to those of you who are serious about this is that you read um, the ind individual ministers, whether they be finance ministers, trade ministers, health ministers, often will meet before these meetings and they will deal with other issues uh, uh, because they're not, they're not seeking a headline, they're not seeking communiques. I'll give you, and I'll simply give you one example of this. At the, la at the German summit, Germany brought up the Compact for Africa. We all understand the situation in Africa. Africa in 20 years will have the largest population of any continent uh, in the world. It will have, it, and if what they are prepared to do is push on for this, for the common market that they're working on, then they have an opportunity, with, and as long as we work with them, to turn Africa into a huge success with a major population base. If they're not able to go to that common market, I think they're going to have difficulties. If you want to know what's going on now in terms of Africa, which I think is a very important issue looking forward, you'll get more out of watching, looking at the finance minister's meeting, the, the documents by individual ministers as to the consistency with which they're dealing with these kinds of issues. And then you'll see, I think, you will understand the success of the G20. I'd like to connect two of the points that Larry said and pitch it for a question about the future of the G20. So Larry talked about uh, greenhouse gas emissions and fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, climate change is an enormous global collective action problem, perhaps the largest we've ever faced. Um, you also talked about how the current administration is not that soft on the idea of multinational organizations and those sorts of discussions. So this is a question, I guess, for Paul, but for both of you. Um, you know, is the current context challenging the G20? What, what do you think about the future of the G20? Is the G20 able to deal um, with or without this current administration, think about now or think about five years from now, can the G20 deal with the kind of global collective action problems that we are facing and other challenges that we are facing? The, the answer is it has to. And, and the reason why it has to is that the, the world that we are looking at is very different than the world from that we are that we are now living. Um, so the great advantage, the great thing that the, the G20 did, it was it recognized, um, it, it recognized China, recognized India, recognized a number of, of emerging economies. Um, but we also understand that all of this has been put together on the basis, and Larry talked about this, of an evolution that goes back. Uh, to the end of the Second World War, the creation of the Bretton Woods institutions based on the huge generosity of the Marshall Plan uh, in which a nation, the leading nation of the time, the hegemon, essentially put its money where its mouth was and it, it, it allowed the, the, the war-torn economies to be, to, to be rebuilt. All of us in this room are the, are the, the beneficiaries of all of that. But all of that is built on the world at, in which it is. The United States is the hegemon. Um, all of the, the, the major economies are largely, are largely European with some, some Asians. But take a look at what it's going to be like in 20 years. The largest economy in the world is going to be China's. Second largest economy can be, if it gets its act together, India's. And the United States, 
will be third. There will be more emerging and successful economies in Asia than there are in Europe. Now that world is not recognized today and uh, to, to the extent, but we're gonna to have to deal with that world. We're, we're gonna to have to deal with no hegemon is going to be able to simply step in and say, this is what is going to happen. There's going to have to be massive negotiation, massive, massive understanding. And that's where the G20, a successful G20 is going to play its role. And the reason that I feel so strongly, and I think a lot of us feel so strongly about the, the G20 today, is that we have all grown up in this room with a hegemon, with the United States being able to say, I've got the money, I've got the military background, and we can make this happen. That's not going to be, that's not going to be the case in 20 years. That's what we're going to have to deal with. And unless there is a body, i.e. the G20, which is capable of constantly pushing the world, negotiating with three major powers, and then a multitude uh, of economies, we're not gonna make it. And I really do believe that the G20 today is the, the dress rehearsal for the world that lies ahead. And that it's gonna be a heck of a lot easier for that world that lies ahead by, in 20 years to operate, to function, if in fact it goes through the death rehearsal now, then find itself in a situation where we can walk away from the Paris Accord if it doesn't make, as, as if it doesn't make any difference, or we can simply change our, uh, we, can ch we, we can make sure that we can destroy the dispute settlement mechanism of the WTO. None of this stuff is gonna be on in that world 20 years from now, and we've gotta deal with it now, and that really is the challenge, I believe, of the G20. So if it has to work, does it need reforms in order to work, or is it good to go? Larry? I'm going to give you a, a different answer. I want to make two other points, if I could. Um, I came into the international system in 1993. I was the deputy to the Treasury Secretary for everything international. And the first meeting I attended was a meeting of then the G7 countries to plan the global financial effort to support the countries that had once been behind the Iron Curtain. And I sat at this meeting with a very experienced counterpart from the uh, State Department, the Foreign Affairs uh, Ministry. And after two or three, two and a half hours of this meeting, I turned to him and I said, this is terrible. Everybody's saying the same thing. It's completely boring. And they're saying what I said, and they're not giving me any credit. And he looked at me and he said, you're not a professor anymore. You're a US official and you're being an idiot. Churchill, said, jaw, jaw, not bang, bang. And that's what we're engaged in here. And the fact that they're all saying what you said and not giving you credit and thinking that it's their idea, that's what we call successful US diplomacy. <laughs> and so if you wanna be a professor, go be a professor. If you wanna be a US official, this is success. And it was a very powerful, I mean, I was stupid enough to need that lecture, but I was smart enough to only need it once. And it tells you something about the benefit of there being international fora. You know, amidst all the darkness and all the dismal stuff we're discussing, something happened in the last several weeks. There's a global fund for AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. It brings together governments, and it brings together civil society, and it brings together philanthropists like the Gates Foundation. It had its pledging conference. For the first time in the last five years, an international pledging conference hit the goal of the international institution being pledged to, in full, 
including the United States, including other nations. That happened even now with all the cleavages and all of that. The fact that people were going to have to show up at meetings like the G20, the fact that there were international institutions and that there was continuing international dialogue was an important part of the reason why that happened. And so, yeah, everything that people think is wrong, roughly speaking, uh, is wrong. On the other hand, you know, a child born on Earth today has only half as great a likelihood of dying before the age of five as a child born in uh, 1990. In the 20 years of the G20, the chance of a child dying has fallen by more than a third. The chance that a random individual on planet Earth lives in extreme poverty is about half of what it was when the G20 was uh, formed. Before long, there are going to be more smartphones on Earth than there are people able to read on Earth. Some of that's because there are a bunch of people in Hong Kong who have three. But still, the vast majority of people are going to be connected to all the world's information in a way that didn't used to be so. So I think it's a, we're right to try to push for a very different philosophy than the US, current US administration has. But I think we make a real mistake if we don't think that under the surface, as a consequence of a lot of the connections that are forged through institutions, good things are happening. I think it's a mistake, and now I'll get to your question. I think it's a mistake um, to think of the G20 apart from its members. You know, you can talk about the Summers family's positions on issues, but really, there isn't really a Summers family separate from my wife, myself, and our children. And in some sense, talking about what the Summers family did and what the Summers family structure should be and what the Summers family's attitude is, apart from the judgments that the members of the family make, is a bit incoherent. And I think the same thing is true with respect to the G20. There is no G20 without the countries that comprise it. I think there are two broad changes in intellectual orientation that are necessary, that if they take hold, a lot of the rest of it will solve itself. And if they don't take hold, you can have all the communiques and all the secretariats and all the change in the meeting schedules and all the reallocation of when the deputies meetings are gonna be and all the changes in which ministers are gonna meet with the heads of state and it won't matter. And those two changes are international cooperation has to be a project directed at the interests of regular people, not elites. It can no longer be, as it must be said it has been for the last 20 years, that the protection of intellectual property, most of which is owned by global corporations, is a first order priority and the avoidance of tax evasion by locating a company somewhere in cyberspace is a second order priority for international uh, cooperation. It can no longer be the case that protection for bilateral investments is a first order priority and the avoidance of regulatory races to the bottom is a second order priority. And so the first reorientation that's necessary is towards an agenda that resonates with the concerns of middle class citizens in all of our countries, the people in Detroit and Dusseldorf rather than the people who come to Davos, uh, if you like. That's the first priority. Second, 
in my judgment, is that we need to recognize that the term the IMF is using this week, synchronized slowdown, is a euphemism for secular stagnation. That we're living in a very different world than the one that Paul and I were involved in in uh, the 1990s. A world with a chronic excess of savings over investment, leading to epically low interest rates, shortages of uh, demand, inflated asset prices because of those low interest rates, difficulty everywhere in achieving inflation targets. In the United States, long-term inflation expectations as measured by the New York Fed reached a new historic low nine years into recovery um, last, uh, last uh, month. And that we need to think about the priority as promoting demand, not just uh, promoting supply. And that's got implications in particular for fiscal policy and public investment, also for uh, social insurance, also for thinking about the financing of green agendas. But unless we diagnose the problem right, if we continue with the platitudes of a previous era, then we're not going to be doing the world a favor. The G20 got it spectacularly right in London. Only a year and a half later, the G20 was getting it spectacularly wrong in a still troubled world economy by falling back to traditional bloviation about the need for fiscal discipline and budget control, the consequence of which was to slow the reemployment of millions of people um, around the world. So rather than focusing on reform of structures, I would focus on what the underlying and animating thinking is. And those would be the two most important areas that I would be looking for change. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah, we yeah. are Could I just, almost out of time. Okay, I, just one second. I'd like to give you actually the, the last chance because up until oh, okay. about three minutes ago, I thought we were going to end on a Larry Summers high note because we were hearing about the good that was happening in the world. And then he got into secular stagnation. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I don't know about you, but I started to feel a little depressed about the future. So I'd like to give it to Paul Martin to bring us home. And... It, I don't know if you, how would you like to end this, Paul Martin? You can end it on a high note. You can give us some notes of optimism that we can address secular stagnation in a serious way. Or any other high note that you'd like. So let me just tell you right now, I'm going to get you, Chris. Right now. <laughs> the, um, first of all, I had, uh, I had supper last night with Larry. I, you can see we are old friends. I told him if he, if he brings up secular stag stagnation, he's going to explain it, not me. Um, uh, but I, I, I essentially agree with the, 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 the Larry's conclusion, but I'm going to take that conclusion a different way. I said earlier that very clearly that G20 has got to be used as a dress rehearsal for the world that lies ahead, not the world that exists today. Because the world that lies ahead of us in one generation is going to be radically different. It's going to be a far more complicated world in which we can operate. But the point that he made in that we've got to not only be talking up here, we've got to be talking really to people who are leading the, in the lives they're leading. Or the for, question of affordability, the question of how am I, why am I going to bring these people into my country if I haven't got a job, all of this. And, but I, I don't think that we can concede. I think what it is that we have to, that we have to, uh, we have to live with it and then we've got to explain what this is all about. And let me just do this. And, in the argument uh, today that you hear in many countries, especially the one to the south, about the importance of national sovereignty. And this is a national sovereignty issue, and for God's sake, you can't impugn uh, national sovereignty. The fact is that we have got to explain and all the kinds of conditions, that, the kinds of decisions that the G20 will make, the kinds of world into which we're going to uh, live, is that national sovereignty, 
is totally dependent on shared sovereignty. That the, the, the climate change issue, which is by far the biggest problem we as a world faces, cannot be faced by an individual country alone. The death of the oceans cannot be faced by an individual country alone. The threat of, of pandemics cannot be felt, fed by an individual country alone. And the, if, what the responsibility of governments are today, those governments who are in the, the G20 uh, or, those, or those that are out, is to explain that the world in which we live is not a world that can leave a, a working a, a class person behind, which is the problem that faces so much of North America and it faces Europe, Europe as well. But it is also that it is no longer possible for a country to think that it can make its decisions uh, separately or without touching the rest of the world. The, the, the definition of national sovereignty has to be a sovereignty which recognizes the limitation of individual governments, which recognizes that, in fact, the only way in which we can exercise our sovereignty is if we are prepared to work with other countries because there are no, there are no more national problems. There are problems that are, exist within your nation. There are problems that if you've got lousy economic policy that you're going to suffer from. But I can tell you the big problems that we all have to face are problems that go extend far beyond our borders. And I really do believe, and I would close this, I guess, on you, I think that the G20 is a dress rehearsal for the world that lies ahead. And that unless we realize that, we are going to spend a lot of time spinning our wheels. And I don't think that we can afford it. Larry Summers and Paul Martin, I could listen to you all day. But uh, my guess is they could listen to you all day, but they're not going to. Um, I want to thank you both for being here today and thank you both for your service uh, over many years uh, in many dimensions. Thank you very much and thank you. Please join me in thanking them.